today. I'd like to welcome you. Uh, I'm glad you've chosen to worship with us this day. I'm Reverend Pamela Scott, and I'm pleased to be serving Strathmore United Church. Our service opens by reading Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of honor and majesty in his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. And today we light the candles as a visible sign of the gift of the Testaments and the Christ candle, Christ, the light of the world.
love abides deep in our very being. All that we are reflects your unceasing mercy. Show us with joy that awakens the possibilities of hope for a needy world. Bathe us in justice that transforms indifference into boldness. May new life be your gift. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And our next hymn is Voices United 372, Though I May Speak. Light, 
whom no one has seen or can see. On the other hand, there are those puzzling, mysterious texts scattered throughout the biblical story. Think of the story of Jacob, the story in which he wrestles with a man all night long. As the story unfolds, Jacob concludes that he has actually been wrestling with God. The text then says, so Jacob named the place Peniel, or face of God, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Think of the story of Moses, the story where he is confronted by his sister and brother, but vindicated by God. God says to Moses' sister and brother, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, not in dark sayings and he beholds the form of the Lord. Moses beholds the form of the Lord, the living God? What did Moses see? Yet when Moses asks to see God, God tells him to hide in the cleft of a rock and says, I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. No human shall see me and live. The Gospel of John develops the story of Jesus this way. John begins his story of Jesus on this note. No one has ever seen God, but God, the only begotten one, who is at the Father's side and has made him known. As we read on, we hear Jesus say things like, Those who believe in me do not believe in me only but in the one who sent me. Philip, one of Jesus' disciples, says to him, Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus responds, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. The unseen has become seeable in Jesus. In Colossians, the Apostle Paul makes the claim that Jesus Christ is the image, so the visible expression of the invisible God. All this leads to another question. Where is the face of Jesus now, so that we may see his face, and in his face, the face of the infinite? Apparently not far away. Pointing to a group of children, Jesus told his disciples, who longed for a clearer vision, this. Whoever receives one child like this in my name, receives me. Whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Jesus is saying that somehow we see his face in the face of the child who cries out for attention. In the parable of the sheep and goats, Jesus speaks of being hungry and us feeding him, and of being a stranger and us welcoming him, and of being sick and us nursing him. Hearing this, we ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Jesus answers, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus is saying that somehow we see his face, and therefore the face of God, in the face of the world's marginalized. We are told that this is the secret of the joy that Mother Teresa found in her work in Calcutta. She saw the in the faces of the discarded infants and the discarded elders, the face of the lover of her soul. Is that what Jesus means by see God? That the pure in heart will recognize and embrace the Holy One in the midst of the ordinary? Or is there more? Children are not Jesus. 
He comes to us in their coming to us, but they are not God. The hungry and the strangers are not Jesus. He comes to us in their coming to us, but they are not God. So is there still another kind of seeing? And what do the pure in heart see when Jesus fulfills his promise? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. See God, a place of mystery. Pure in heart. What does Jesus mean by pure in heart? And is it really possible to have it, to be it? In the Bible, heart does not only refer to the organ that pumps our blood. Heart refers to the center of a human person, the center where feeling and thinking and willing sit. The word pure, working from the Greek katharos, means unmixed, unalloyed, or unadulterated, as in pure gold or pure maple syrup. Here it helps to remember that the Beatitudes, Jesus is describing one person. The Beatitudes describe eight qualities of the same person. The eight kingdom qualities are all interrelated, and the order in which Jesus presents them is intentional. Jesus does not begin with pure in heart, because it needs to be heard and seen in light of the qualities that precede it. The pure in heart are also pure, poor in spirit. They know they need God. The pure in heart whom Jesus blesses are also those who mourn. By mourning they open their hearts and are comforted. They are those who are meek. They graciously cooperate with proper authority. They know when to be angry and when to control their anger. The pure in heart are those who crave right relatedness. They are also merciful. Their own poverty of spirit, grief and hunger and thirst create a tenderness toward and sympathy for their fellow humans. They understand and feel the common human struggles and failures. How is pure in heart used in other places in the Bible? Psalm 24 goes like this. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift their soul to falsehood and have not sworn deceitfully. This would suggest that pure in heart has to do with integrity. Blessed are those who have integrity at the center. Blessed are those who crave truth, who seek truth, face truth, tell truth, and live truth. Blessed are those who are utterly sincere. Blessed are those whose whole life, public and private, is transparent before God and others. How do you become pure in heart? You focus on Jesus. Admire him. Rejoice that Jesus is your brother, your friend, your Lord and Savior. Once you look at Jesus, don't turn back and look at yourself. Don't wonder where you stand with him. Just keep your focus on Jesus. Blessed are those who have left behind the preoccupation with how well they are doing and are simply captivated by Jesus of Nazareth. For they will, be, they will see God. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Be thou my wisdom, my calm in all strife, I ever with thee, and thou in my life. Thou loving parent, thy child may I be, thou in me dwelling, and I one with thee. Be thou my battle shield, sword for the fight, be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul's shelter, thou my high tower. Raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor vain empty praise. Thou my inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only, the first of my heart. Great God of heaven, my treasure thou art. Great God of heaven, after victory won, 
May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun, heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Amen and amen. Our next hymn is More Voices 73, O God, Why Are You Silent? Once they are freed, your gifts helps victims seek justice for what they have been through 
and regain a sense of worth and acceptance. Your generosity also is also preventative, helping provide the education that is needed to offer protection against predators. With your help, young women like Lakshmi have a second chance at freedom, and families like hers can get their children back safely. Now more than ever, the world needs your generosity. Thank you for your gifts through mission and service. Let us commit ourselves in service as we worship God with our offering.
liberty and peace. Go forth, knowing that the love of God surrounds you, the peace of Christ infuses you, and the joy of the Holy Spirit sustains you, now and always. Amen.